original super fun and all about artisan cheese and more to melt your peaceful heart and toast your peaceful life. Coming to you from the Appalachian Mountains of southwestern Virginia, this is the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hey, this is Scott Hall from Peaceful Heart Farm, and you are listening to the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hello, everybody. Melanie Hall here. I hope you're doing very, very well. The conversation today and every day revolves around the value of tradition. Traditional food prep and storage, traditional cooking, and of course, traditional artisan cheese. Topics discussed here are designed to create new perspectives and possibilities for how you might add the taste of tradition to your life. In today's show, I will, of course, give you some homestead life updates. Then I want to talk about the basics of cheese making. That's going to lead up to what actually gives uh, cheese its flavor profiles. But you really need to know a little bit about how cheese is made to to get uh, a better grasp on that. And then today's recipe is going to be a seasonal recipe. It's going to be Easter leg of lamb. All right. So our homestead life updates. Let's see. What do we got going on? Well, we're trying to get uh, Dora trained for milking still. This morning, she didn't even come to the milking shed. She was way off in the woods and I didn't go down there and get her. I should have. Anyway, tomorrow's another day and we have a new halter that is just the right size for her. And uh, so we'll try that. We're going to try leading her in. That worked for her mom. We don't have any calves or lambs yet, so we're still waiting on those. Uh, Now, the last of the hay went out yesterday. And uh, so what that means is no matter what, these animals are going out on the grass pastures as soon as that hay is consumed. They've been kind of in a winter quarters where we feed them hay and um, they stand around there all day eating and kind of uh, peeing and pooping and then that all gets mixed together and it makes a really really nice composted uh, dirt but as soon as the grass gets tall enough they go out on the grass and the grass is greening up nicely Uh, we're expecting a bit of rain for a couple of days next week and the temps are going to be in the 70s so these are all really good signs for a successful spring launch into those lush pastures now, the creamery uh, walls are continuing to rise. It is so exciting to go out there every day and see the progress. Um, and I know we're taking a long, long time to get this creamery built, but it's just the two of us, and Scott's pretty much doing it on his own. He does have help from a friend from time to time for some extra heavy work that he absolutely cannot do alone. But anyway, since we're taking so long to get our cheese out to you, I am looking into setting up uh, cow shares, uh, and uh, that will allow us to assist you in your goals for being able to have raw dairy products. So how it works is, um, it, this is how it works in the state of Virginia. You buy part of a cow, all right? You buy part of a cow, and then we board that cow for you, and we feed it, we care for it, and we milk it for you. We'll even make you some yogurt uh, or butter and or butter uh, if you if you would like that and if you're interested in this kind of an arrangement uh, please visit us at www.peacefulheartfarm.com get on our mailing list so you can be first in line when we open this up the number of shares will be extremely limited uh, due to our herd size but um, perhaps some fresh cheeses, obviously, and the milk and the butter, those would be a great way for you to get into it. So you, you have an initial buy-in buy uh, amount to buy part of the cow, and then you have a monthly fee where we board it and feed it and care for it and do the milking for you. And that'll be seasonal. We are seasonal uh, in our operation, so it's not going to be a year-round. We, will, we are planning to milk from March th- through uh, probably the beginning of to the middle of December. So there'll be about three months where you wouldn't uh, have any kind of milk products. All right. So that's called cow shares. 
uh, again, visit the website www.peacefulheartfarm.com and sign up on our mailing list and uh, you'll get my newsletter every week and I will keep you updated on where we are with that particular process. The spring garden, let's talk about that. That's really on the move. Um, adding to the seeds that I planted last week, I planted onions, three full beds of onions. Um, and then inside I have celery growing. And so I transplanted all that stuff to bigger pots. And I have strawberries lined up for planting tomorrow. Uh, inside also I have early tomato plants and eggplant and eggplants. They've sprouted. Uh, some of them have their first true leaves on them. But it's going to be weeks yet before they get out into the garden. Now Easter is fast approaching. I want you to come see us. Come see us at the at the uh, Withfield Farmers Market and pick up some Easter lamb. We have bone-in legs, boneless shoulder roasts, and ground lamb. And choose a free recipe card with your purchase. I have uh, created three recipe cards for the Easter season. So I have Greek e Greek meatballs for Easter. I have Easter leg of lamb and a southwestern shoulder roast. So you can use a leg, a shoulder, or ground uh, to to make your Easter uh, dinner. Email me at melanie at peacefulheartfarm.com. M-E-L-A-N-I-E at peacefulheartfarm.com. If you'd like to pick up at the farm instead of at the farmer's market. All right, so let me get back. Let me get on into uh, the basics of cheese making. So it has been my experience that the more you know about how something is made and what goes into it, the better you can appreciate the value and the tradition that surrounds it. And understanding cheese making fundamentals will help you. Um, Will, will help me help you clarify the differences between types of cheeses. And um, it also ex helps to explain how individual cheeses express their distinctions and their character. Because when you get down all down to it, it's uh, we have, uh, well, Professor Frank uh, Kozakowski, he founded the American Cheese Society. He outlined eight basic steps which have become the standard for how cheese is made. All right, so we're going to go through those. But first, let's look at some of the additional varied procedures that are involved in cheese making. We know today this is outside of the eight steps. And um, then um, let's consider the raw material that is milk that goes into cheese. And then I will outline from a layperson's perspective Kozakowski's eight basic steps in making cheese. All right, so let's talk about some cheese developments. Um, from a historical viewpoint, um, each of the historical steps represents one step in a series of technological advances. Um, in the centuries-long evolution of this artisan craft, these advances led to innovations in the cheese recipes. They added complexity. They created distinctions and uh, defined the various modern cheese types that we have. So the first step, acidification of milk, remains the basis for all cheeses. Uh, in fact, some still don't require much more than that. Go back and take a look at that lemon cheese recipe in the History of Cheese episode, um, or the creme fraiche recipe that was in the Why Normandy Cows episode. And the links will be in the show notes. So those, again, acidification, it goes through all the eight steps, but it, there's, there are, some of them are really, really simple. Um, prehistoric fresh cheeses uh, that were, they were not all that far removed from today's like sour cream, clotted cream, or cork. These eventually evolved into something something that resembles like a basic farmer's cheese, um, also known as white cheese or a queso blanco or queso fresco. So white cheese, fresh cheese. Uh, that's pretty common today. After simple souring to make those fresh cheeses, the next big step is the coagulation of milk to form curds, which is generally done via the proteolytic enzymes contained in rennet uh, from the stomachs of young ruminant animals. 
that's the very substances that help the young uh, sucklings break down the proteins and digest their mother's milk. So you could say that the discovery of the use of rennet started modern cheese making because it opened the door to adding the curing and the aging steps. Um, now it's assumed that, that this advance in technology was stumbled upon through happenstance uh, kind of discovery. I've talked about this in previous episodes. Like uh, some clever shepherd used an animal stomach to transport milk. And then, you know, they noticed that the milk ended up in this large lump with lots of water around it. And it tasted pretty good and it lasted longer uh, before souring beyond recognition. So shepherds may have been the ones to develop a useful procedure for preserving milk in a tasty, transportable form. You know, voila, modern cheese was born. Now, further developments beginning in Roman times and extending into the Industrial Revolution of the 18th and 19th centuries um, included more extensive draining as well as cooking and pressing, molding, milling, and salting. Um, These procedures resulted in harder cheeses that can be aged, stored, and or transported. And that certainly opened the door to a major food staple and commodity for trade. Once it became shelf stable. Uh, These advances also posted uh, logistical challenges and they required the invention and manufacture of mechanical devices. So you have vats and you have baskets or colanders, uh, pots, kettles, knives. And then um, you have efficient cutting and cooking and draining tools. So all of these things have developed over time step by step. Um, And let's look at some of the cheeses that came out of these basic developmental steps. So first of all, you had large format commodity types of cheeses. First, you had just the fresh cheese that we just talked about. But then you get into these large commodity cheeses. So by Roman times, cheesemakers had established procedures for making hard cheeses. Uh, These cheeses were larger. Um, They utilized rennet coagulation and they used cooking, pressing, and salting. Um, They developed a procedure to make the rennet. They would either dry the young ruminant stomachs and cut them into strips and then add a strip to the milk. Or they would um, stir in a rennet solution that was made with brine by brining the stomach. Now, uh, so those were the larger hard cheeses uh blue cheeses so encouraging blue cheeses to ripen blue molds to ripen cheeses uh such as roquefort that dates back to pre-roman times the roquefort recipe of today uh, which includes propagating the molds in large loaves of bread specifically baked for that purpose was codified over 300 years ago Now let's look at smoking. Ancient artisan cheesemakers often lived in mountain huts and to keep themselves warm, to dispel flies, and to dry their cheeses, they built fires inside the hut. And as a result, their cheeses would acquire pleasant, smoky flavors. All right, so there there you have the origination of smoking. Now what about mixed milk cheeses? Small family farms would make the young cheeses for their own consumption from the milk that they didn't drink. These small operations, they might only have one or two cows, a few sheep, a goat, not enough of one species to fill the cheese making vat. So they blended the milk and delicious results evolved. What about leaf wrapping? Soft and semi-soft primordial type cheeses uh, were often used as currency and sometimes brought to market. For this, they needed protection, so they were wrapped in leaves. Lo and behold, this technique also offered some nice flavor benefits. So today, you got cheese wrapped in grapevine leaves, and as well as others, and that marks this ancient method. Commodity cheeses. 
among the cheese making steps beginning um, in the 16th and early 17th centuries, so 15 1600s, was partial skimming of the cream. You're removing the cream to make butter, and that created uh, cheese making milk that underwent higher and more rapid acidification. So this was the first step towards bigger, harder, lower moisture cheeses. Uh, the, those large commodity cheeses that can be saved for a long time, can be transported over long distances and, and used for uh, uh, at markets. So further steps in making these, you have scalding, pressing, cheddaring, salting the curds themselves as opposed to an external salting com commonly uh, that's used in fresh cheeses. All right, now we have, how about some early vegetarian cheeses? Uh, Sephardic Jews in Iberia, that's western Spain, eastern Portugal, they invented, um, or at least they advanced, the practice of using plant coagulation. So that's thistle renneting of curds to make uh, cheeses that would be proper for their kosher di diet. And that began about 1,500 years ago. So e today we use a rennet. A, a vegetable rennet is made from thistle. So monk or monastery cheeses, I've talked about those. Monks were prodigious farmers and dairymen. Um, and they also developed fermented brewed drinks, such as Abbey Ales, which they often used to wash their cheeses. So then you have washed rind cheeses that began to evolve about 1,500 years ago um, with the gradual spread of Christianity and construction of these monetary, uh, monasteries across Europe. Munster is an example of a modern descendant of the medium-sized, semi-soft luxury cheeses, uh, which still maintain their traditional form. Bloomy rind cheeses, those are the brie and camembert types. So they've, they've got that nice white mold growing on the surface of the rind. Um, they're made with creamy, rich milk that's acidified overnight. It's gently ladled into draining and shaping forms. And uh, the, it has molds in it that ripen on the surface. Uh, this has likely been produced in rustic versions since at least late medieval times. Um, these They originated in the Ile de France region, not far from Paris, and in nearby Normandy. Again, I talked about that a little bit when I talked about the Normandy cows. All right, so uh, those are some of the basic t development of basic types of cheeses. Um, now, what's in cheese? Uh, uh, now, since cheese is essentially concentrated preserved milk with some salt added, in order to answer this question, we need to take a step back and answer a more fundamental one. What's in milk? Um, the solid content of milk, the, the milk solids, approximately 12.5% in cows to about 19% in sheep. Uh, it's the principal solids uh, in these milks are the protein casein. There's the sugar, lactose, and butter fat. So you've got the macros there. You've got protein, you've got fat, you've got uh, carbohydrate. All of which are dispersed or emulsified in water. Um the fact that all of the solids in the milk are not dissolved, but rather they float in like little self-contained units within an emulsion, is what makes cheese making possible. It, support, it supports the separation of the milk solid curds from the watery whey. Um, vitamins and minerals are an important part of milk's composition. Milk contains the vitamins A, B1, 2, 3, 6, and 12. D, E, and K. All of these and the minerals account for less than 1% of milk's total volume. Um, however, they are significant nutrients. Minerals also contribute flavor and texture to the cheese. The principal minerals in milk are calcium and phosphorus. 
And it also contains sodium, potassium, and magnesium, as well as trace elements, including zinc, iron, manganese, and copper. Lots of nutrition in the milk. And that's why your cheese is so nutritious as well. You also have a variability in milk composition. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about that. We talked about the consistency of it. Let's talk about the variability. So you have different species that have different breeding lactation cycles. So the sheep, goats, cows, other animals that are milked, they have different breeding and lactation cycles. And uh, that's determined by their gestation periods their, and their expected ranges for weaning. So cows can milk for about a year, as an example. And then um, goats, five months, six months, seven months, they don't milk nearly as long as a cow because they can wean earlier. Um, and this is the main reason that most traditional cheeses are not made year round. The animal simply does not produce, easily produce, naturally produce milk year round. Um, a cow will produce milk for about a, a year at a time, but you really, they have to have a cow, a calf every year to continue to produce milk. And you do not want to have them continuing to produce a lot of milk while they're growing that calf. So usually three months um, are, the cow would be dry. The last three months, the last trimester of their uh, pregnancy, they would not be, have that added burden of producing a lot of milk. Now, another crucial factor in determining milk composition is what's called terroir. It's all the components of environment and geography, the water and the feed. Um, you've, uh, the water will affect the milk and the cheese character on two counts. First, via the ground or the melt water, which irrigates the animal's plant foods. And then second, via the drinking water that's given to the animals. So we have good well water here, and of course we get lots of good rain. So both of those things are providing a specific terroir to our, the, the milk that our cows produce. So whatever local traits that that water possesses, the certain mineral flavors, for example, those are likely to show up in a cheese. And then what the animals eat will also determine the taste of the milk and the cheese. The fundamental contrast um, between a diet of dry feed in the winter and pasture plants in the summer. Uh, for the most part, we're always on pasture. There'll be a little bit of, of hay in the spring and in the fall and of course all winter, but we're not milking through the winter. So that you'll have uh, spring and fall differences in, in the taste of the milk. Besides going through the whole lactation cycle, the milk changes as well. And the types of plants eaten are going to be unique from farm to farm and region to, to, to region. So no two farms are going to produce the same terroir. And so their cheeses could be made absolutely exactly the same, and they would not be the same cheese. All right, let's get to uh, Kazakowski's eight basic steps of uh, cheese making. So uh, now that we know what's in the milk and cheese, then let's discuss how the cheese is made. Step one, setting the milk. And I've talked a little bit about this already, but that is step one, setting the milk, the acidification and coagul coagulation. Um, so uh, acidification occurs naturally if the milk is left to sour on its own and the inherent or ambient bacteria ferment the lactose into lactic acid. That's what's happening when you have like a sour cream that's left just to sour on its own or acidify on its own. Um, so cheesemakers would normally add bacterial starter cultures to jumpstart that progress. And so there are different cultures. I'm not going to get into the cultures at this point, but you have a lot of different cultures that go in there uh, that start the cheese making process. And that's going to, when you're adding cultures, you're going to dramatically uh, change the, uh, the end product of the cheese. Coagulation is considered... Uh, first, among the microbiological miracles, without which cheese as we know it would not exist. It's a natural chemical reaction. It transforms that fresh liquid milk into the one of the world's most delicious solids. Coagulation makes one giant curd. All right, so that leads us to step two. We've acidified the milk. 
we might have added some cultures to help that acidification um, in a specific way and then we coagulated it into uh, one big curd so that's step one step two is cutting the curds once the milk has uh, coagulated into that giant smooth curd it's going to naturally begin to contract and expel the whey and that whey consists mostly of water uh, the technical term for this process is cineresis and the more surface area that the curds have the more cineresis will occur um, this means that the more the curds are cut that is the smaller the pieces the less moisture they will retain to produce a softer cheese with higher moisture content the curds will be left larger whereas for a harder cheese with less less moisture then you're going to cut them smaller so they will it will begin to break down on its own but you want to cut it into a specific size that you want it depending on again the kind of cheese that you're going to make step three is cooking and holding now this third basic step involves some amount of heating or cooking of the curds as well as a holding period during which they're left to sit in the vat while the effects of acidif acidification and cutting if applicable and heating proceed timing here is crucial the time and temperature of cooking is adjusted according to the composition of the milk and the nature of the curds the smaller the particles for example the hotter they will get um, curds again intended to become softer higher moisture like a bloomy rind cheese such as camembert they're going to undergo relatively mild heating and a gradual cooling and uh, resting period with little or no stirring you're not even disturbing it much um, so semi-soft might require slightly more heating and some more gentle stirring and then the curds for harder cheeses are cooked and that is they're heated to higher temperatures and they're also stirred more and that's again you're going to pull out more whey the more you handle it the more whey is going to come out of it step four dipping and draining uh, curds are transferred usually by way of a scoop or a ladle to some sort of draining receptacle or a mold um, draining vessels they're usually some form of a basket or colander uh, but occasionally a large uh, cheesecloth uh, bag is used um, a plain circular hoop sometimes is used um, at this point the cheese making milk has separated into a whitish or cream colored curd and greenish or yellowish whey all right so we're separating the curds from the whey and draining step five is knitting the curd or curd fusion um, during this stage the curd particles fuse together into a uniform body remember we cut them up into little bitty pieces but they um, begin to, to uh, fuse together and attain and they're going to attain a distinct consistency depending on the recipe and the eventual cheese type goal the knitting can occur in the vat it can be in the draining vessel such as again the hoop a mold or a basket um, or in a press where weight is applied so that's knitting that uh, curd together step six is the pressing and this step takes anywhere from a few hours to a few days and uh, sometimes it just involves hanging the cheese up and it's its own self pressure um, it, you, it, it's designed to exert varying degrees of pressure to achieve the desired moisture content the density and the texture of the cheese um, a soft and semi-soft cheeses uh, bloomy or washed rind cheeses they're drained drag yeah, drained gradually uh, so they'll be in a bag or, or in their molds and they don't really have external pressure put on them but a harder type they're going to have weights put on top of them or pressure that's going to be applied by various devices and how much pressure is applied and for how long helps determine moisture content again density texture right so it's all about moisture content density texture once you get to separating the way out now step seven is salting uh, salt is a main ingredient in cheese not only for taste but for moisture reduction and control of bacteria and molds salt can be applied in two ways it can be dry or wet 
So dry salting, that's going to occur either before or after pressing. So if it's before pressing, the salt is sprinkled in and on the, the curd mass where it begins to exert its effect on the development of the cheese more immediately. So that's before you actually are starting that knitting and pressing process. And if it's after it's pressed and it's into its form, then you'll have a sprinkle or rub it on the surface um, as it's about to go into the aging process. So it's, um, you would do a camembert would be done that way. Wet salting is uh, proper, properly referred to as brining. Uh, for this technique, cheeses are immersed in a salt water solution for anywhere from several hours to several days. Uh, brining recipes and brining procedures vary and they have subtle yet significant effects on the final results. Now, washed rind cheeses have brine, um, among other things, uh, that are actually rubbed onto them during the aging. All right, so they have the brine, but then they have other solutions that go on to them, and that's where you get that washed rind. Step eight is special treatments and curing. Um, this step, a series of treatments, many of them optional, uh, marks the end of the active phase, the formation process, and the beginning of ripening. Curds are now cheese, uh, but they have a long way to go before they become great cheese. Uh, their traits have been etched, but their true character has yet to emerge. Curing is a term to describe treatments introduced for desired effects during agings. These might include rubbings or brushings or sprayings. Remember, uh, the, the leaves, you could wrap them in leaves or bark, wrapping in cloth, regular turnings. All of these are part of ensuring that the final stages of that cheese or that cheese comes out perfectly the way that you want it. All right, that's it. That's it for the steps in cheese making. Even the simplest cheese goes through all eight of these steps, from a fresh lemon cheese created in a matter of hours to a two-year or more aged cheese, such as our Dutch-style Ararat legend. It is the variations along the way that create each unique cheese flavor profile. Um, in the next podcast, I want to talk about cheese flavor, what it is and where it comes from. And I hope these basics, with these basics, you'll be able to follow along more easily with that discussion because I'll talk about these different um, areas. All right, let's get to today's recipe. Easter is fast approaching. Today I'm presenting a recipe for uh, creating the center piece for that great traditional Easter dinner. All right, Easter leg of lamb. Sounds big and complicated. It is big usually, uh, but it's not really complicated. Easter, uh, the Easter lamb, it may be what's on the menu for your big family dinner. It is a tradition that goes back to ancient times. And because sheep adapt well to a variety of climates and they're raised the world over, you've got many recipes that span the globe. Uh, let me give some examples. In Argentina, whole young lambs are cooked close to smoky, glowing wood embers. In Italy, legs are coated with garlic, herbs, and breadcrumbs and slowly roasted. In Syria, chunks of lamb shoulder are scented with cumin, uh, braised slowly, and uh, served with mahamara, uh, a wonderful red pepper dip made with Aleppo pepper, garlic, and spices. All right. To start and continue your family tradition, here's how to make that special Easter leg of lamb entree. What you're going to need, you're going to need a leg of lamb bone in, probably six to seven pounds. It can be a little five and a half, up to eight, whatever. Uh, lamb legs vary pretty broadly. You're going to use um, a quarter cup of lemon juice, um, eight cloves of garlic, minced, uh, three tablespoons of fresh rosemary leaves, chopped, or if you get dry, have dried, you can use three teaspoons of dried. Uh, let's see, two teaspoons of salt, one teaspoon of black pepper. All right, then you're going to have a sauce, right? So that's for the lamb. Lamb, lemon juice, garlic, rosemary, salt, and pepper. Uh, for the sauce, you're going to have a cup of 
of fresh herbs, and that's going to be a combination of rosemary, chives, and parsley. You want two cups of diced onions, two cups of lamb stock, or you can use chicken stock if you don't have lamb stock, um, and a cup of red wine. So that's going to make the sauce. All right, what are we going to do? We're going to preheat the oven to 400 degrees. You're going to rub the lamb all over with lemon juice. Get it wet. And then you're going to pat the garlic and rosemary evenly over the lamb. And then season it with salt and pepper. All right, so you pat on the garlic and rosemary, sprinkle on your salt and pepper, put it in a roasting pan in the oven, roast for 30 minutes, reduce the temperature to 350, and the cooking uh, continue for an hour for a medium rare or until the thermometer registers 145 to 150. Make sure you're not touching the bone with the thermometer. Then you're going to remove the roast from the pan and allow it to rest for 10 to 15 minutes before carving. While that's going on, you're going to position that roasting pan over your stove burners and then add the mixed herbs and the onions to the pan. You've got a cup of herbs and two cups of onions. Stir it, combine it with the pan drippings, then add the stock and the wine to deglaze the pan, basically getting all the little bits off of the pan. You're going to reduce that liquid over high heat until it becomes a sauce consistency. This is a reduction sauce. Uh, approximately 20 minutes. Be patient with it. You will know when it thickens. And it'll do it kind of suddenly. Um, then you're going to slice the lamb and serve it with the sauce dribbled over the top. It is amazing. And I know reduction sauce might sound a little complicated. The name sounds a little complicated. But I guarantee you that if you give it a try, you will see just how easy it is to make. Um, you'll be off and running in lots of other areas with that new skill. There are lots of places you can use a reduction sauce. All right, final thoughts. That's it for this week's podcast. And I hope you enjoyed learning about how cheese is made. Stay tuned for next week when I will be discussing how that process applies to what makes cheese taste this way or that way. And uh, we're always having fun here on the homestead. So look for upcoming tours where you can join in on that. And please come visit us at the Withfield Farmer's Market to give your to get your leg of lamb to make that traditional Easter dinner. Or drop me an email if you want to pick it up at the farm. We'd love to meet you personally. We currently have lamb, beef, and goat available for purchase. No cheese for now, but again, stay tuned and let us know what you think about owning a share of a cow so you can enjoy the benefits of raw milk products without the hassle of taking care of the animal yourself. We take very good care of our animals. As always, I'm here to help you taste the traditional touch. Thank you so much for listening, and until next time, may God fill your life with grace and peace.